you very much. It's actually, uh, the whole series of talks has been great because uh, both Thierry's and Hannah's talks, I think, provide a wonderful introduction for the kinds of ideas that I'll be telling you about. All right, so, um, so my group in the physics department over at MIT, uh, I'd say our, our general focus is to use laboratory microcosms that we can uh, control experimentally in order to try to understand how interactions between individuals in a population can really dictate both the evolutionary and the ecological dynamics of that population. In particular, uh, what I'll be telling you about today is what I believe is a very kind of general and, and powerful force for the stabilization of diversity within a population. I think that uh, this, uh, this Benetton commercial, uh, I think, nicely captures uh, what is a, a really overriding theme in much of uh, evolution, which is trying to understand uh, what is the origin of the remarkable uh, phenotypic and genotypic uh, diversity that we see in populations. Now, of course, uh, in the in this, uh, in this photo, perhaps the explanation is a little bit prosaic in the sense that maybe there was alternative adaptation to different environments followed by migration to, you know, to the fashion streets of New York. But what I'll be telling you about today are cases in which even within a single environment, right, so when a population adapts to a particular environment, maybe there are still ways in which you can evolve a remarkable level of diversity. In particular, what I'll be telling you about are cases in which there's negative uh, frequency dependence. What this means is that the fitness cannot be defined in the absence of other individuals in the population. And in particular, there are cases where the rare strategies or rare genotypes, rare phenotypes, do better than common, uh, uh, the common phenotypes. And that leads to evolution and stabilization of diversity. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll tell you about uh, a couple different model systems that we've been working with uh, in the group to try to understand uh, this process. So I'll first tell you about, a, about cases in which there are social interactions, such as what you might call cooperation and cheating, if you like. And in particular, in many cases, uh, antibiotic resistance in bacteria is conferred via an enzyme that enzymatically removes the antibiotic. Now, in those cases, it may be, the, it may be, uh, you may be in the situation where uh, bacteria that do not have the gene required for resistance, i.e. sensitive bacteria, they can nevertheless spread in a population of resistant bacteria. So there's a sense in which they can act as cheaters and they can survive because the resistant bacteria are protecting them. Right? Then I'm going to switch gears a little bit and tell you about uh, experiments that we've been doing in, again, this GAL system that Hannah very nicely uh, illustrated for you, trying to understand something about heterogeneity in clonal populations. In particular, what I'd like to do is make the argument that in some cases, this heterogeneity in a clonal population may be the implementation of an evolutionarily stable mixed strategy. All right, so this is uh, applying ideas from game theory to try to understand uh, the evolution of biological populations. And in a very concrete context, what I'm going to say is that uh, these mixed strategies may naturally evolve in a situation wh in which you have a mixture of different, uh, different food sources, such as a mixture of glucose and galactose. And we can argue over the Q&A about what this all means. All right, so, uh, so all right, antibiotic resistance. Now, you know, all of you know that, uh, that antibiotic resistance is a huge problem clinically. Uh, and also, it's, uh, it's a fascinating problem from the standpoint of ecology, because if you just take a scoop of dirt from the soil, we'll see that uh, there's a huge range of uh, phenotypes within uh, the bacteria in that soil. All right, so some bacteria are resistant to antibiotics, some are not. Uh, and, that, and also, some bacteria produce different antibiotics, others do not. So there's a question there of where does this remarkable diversity come from? Okay. Now, uh, what, we're, what we have been working on is trying to understand a case in which uh, the resistant bacteria, as I said, they enzymatically inactivate the antibiotic. And in particular, what I'll be telling you about are experiments in the beta-lactam ampicillin, where resistance in this bacteria comes on a, a, via a plasmid that encodes the gene beta-lactamase that will break down that antibiotic. Okay. Now, if it, in, in this situation, this collection of, of cells may kind of collectively inactivate the drug and make it kind of innocuous. Right, now, in those situations, you have to ask, well, what happens if a couple of those cells actually didn't even carry the plasmid that conferred resistance? Okay. Now, you'd say, oh, well, those cells should die. And, and indeed, by themselves, they would. However, if they are in the presence of all these resistant cells that are going to go break down that antibiotic, then in that case, maybe those, re those sensitive cells will actually not only survive, but may even be able to outgrow the resistant population because they don't have to pay the cost associated with copying and carrying that plasmid, right, which we measure to be 5%, 10%, depending on the plasmid. Okay. Now, of course, this is uh, an interesting idea, and indeed, uh, using at least mutants of this, uh, this antibiotic resistance gene that, where, the, uh, where the enzyme is secreted outside of the cell, at least in some circumstances, there's hints that this could occur, but we wanted to know, uh, just with the normal, uh, normal gene that we all use in our laboratory, uh, kind of what happens, right? So what we did is we competed these two strains, all right, the bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic, the bacteria that are sensitive, and we're just growing them in well-mixed batch culture, the simplest thing you can possibly imagine. 
right? So we mix them together, we let them grow, and then what we do is we just dilute each day, and we just track the dynamics of these two subpopulations over time, and again by flow cytometry, as Hannah mentioned. Okay? Now the first thing you might ask is, well, if you start with a population that is 95% resistant, so you just have a few of these sensitive cells, okay, and then we're gonna just track the dynamics of the population over time, and this is in the presence of 100 micrograms per mil ampicillin, so it's quite a lot of antibiotic. In particular, this is maybe twice what we typically use in the laboratory to select for our resistant cells when we do, for example, genetic manipulations. Okay? And it's also uh, well above clinical concentrations of these sorts of antibiotics in, 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 in patients. Right? Now, if we just track the population dynamics or the, of this uh, plasmid over time, what we see is that, indeed, the resistant fraction is decreasing. Okay? So we can see that what it looks like is that those sensitive cells, not only are they surviving, but they're actually spreading in the population. Right? So they're really uh, somehow taking advantage of those resistant cells, and they're nearly taking over the population here. Indeed, of course, you can imagine in the laboratory we can start with many different fra initial fractions. What you see is that over time it looks like we're reaching some sort of equilibrium between the resistant population and the sensitive population. Okay? Now, in other cases that we've studied where we have negative frequency dependent selection, what we found is that if you start below some equilibrium, then you just get a very kind of smooth and steady increase to that equilibrium. And that's what, uh, what I told you about maybe a year and a half ago when I was talking about cooperation and cheating in the context of uh, yeast sucrose metabolism. However, in this case, if you start with a low fraction resistant, what we see is a little bit surprising maybe, which is that in this case we get this big kind of overshoot where the resistant fraction hops up here and then slowly comes back down. Okay, so what's happening is that if we start with a small fraction of resistant cells in the population, then it takes a long time for those resistant cells to break down the antibiotic, and that causes the sensitive cells to start dying. Okay? But, but eventually that resistant fraction will remove the antibiotic, and then everybody grows up. Right? And that's what leads to the resistant fraction kind of jumping up. But you can see that it eventually evolves back down. Okay? Now, a very simple way to kind of get at these sorts of dynamics just over the course of one cycle is to just, at, over one day, start populations with many different fractions of resistance, and then measure the resistant fraction at the end of the day, because in all of these situations, we, we see that the populations grow to saturation, so they use up all the resources, right? So the population size overall doesn't really change. Okay? So when we went and we did this measurement, what we got is the following. So this is what's known as a difference map, and that's because there's some sense that this is discrete dynamics, so it's happening each day, right? We can start populations in many different initial resistant fraction, measure what it is at the end of the day, and we get this curve here uh, shown in purple, right? What you can see is that there's gonna be some equilibrium when the initial and final fractions are the same. And also, these sorts of difference maps can be used to determine the dynamics of the population via something known as cobwebbing, where you can kind of start here and kind of travel along these curves, right? Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about the dynamic aspect, but it's, uh, it's kind of a fun, uh, fun way to think about the problem. Okay, so this is telling us, indeed, we get an equilibrium between resistant and sensitive bacteria. Right, so this is the stabilization of this case genetic diversity via these sorts of interactions between resistant and sensitive bacteria. Right, but you might naturally ask, well, how is it that, for example, what determines this equilibrium fraction of resistance in the population? What determines how many resistant bacteria you're gonna have in this context or in that context? Well, we can just go and change things such as the concentration of the antibiotic. Right, so what I'm showing here is data. Again, measurements of this difference map, you can see different concentrations of antibiotic. In blue here, in the absence of antibiotic, the curve just looks like this, and this says that if you don't have any antibiotic, the population will just come down to zero resistance. All right, that makes a lot of sense, because there's a cost associated with carrying that plasmid. However, as we start adding antibiotic, what you see is that this equilibrium is kind of moving up. So it's telling us that as we add more and more antibiotic, we get a larger fraction of the population being resistant. Okay, that, and that makes sense as well, because there should be some sense in which antibiotics should lead to some level of resistance in the population. Okay, but in general, we're getting coexistence uh, between these two uh, subpopulations, even in very high concentrations of antibiotic. Okay. We can then go and we can quantify this. So what I'm plotting here is the equilibrium resistant fraction as a function of the concentration of the antibiotic. What you can see is that above low concentrations here, uh, the, the dynamic is rather simple, and that the equilibrium resistant fraction is really just proportional to the concentration of the antibiotic. Okay. Now, what we can do is turn another knob. Instead of changing the concentration of antibiotic, we can now change how much we dilute by each day. Right, so in this data, we were diluting by 100, but we can change that. Or, I'm sorry, this one was 200. Now we're going to 100, 400, and 800. All right, so this is just asking at the end of each day how much we dilute by. How many cells do we start each day with? And what you can see is that the data are really rather well behaved. And 
what we found is that a very, very simple model of bacterial growth in the presence of antibiotics makes some striking predictions. All right, now this model, I don't want to get too much into it, but I'll just tell you that uh, it's consistent with what we measure independently, which is that the resistant bacteria are essentially uh, unaffected by the concentrations of antibiotic that we're using, whereas the sensitive bacteria, uh, they divide exponentially below some concentration of anti antibiotic, but they die above that concentration, right? So it's as simple as you could possibly imagine, right? But that simple model makes a rather striking prediction, which is that if you take all this data, and instead of plotting the resistant fraction at equilibrium, you instead plot the, uh, the number of resistant bacteria, okay, controlling for our, how much we dilute by, then the prediction is that all of this data should collapse onto a single curve predicted by the model. And indeed, when we did that, uh, did that analysis, what we found is that it really does, it really does happen, that there's a remarkable collapse of the data over orders of magnitude of concentration of the antibiotic. So this is really saying that uh, this is a situation where a, a really simple toy model quantitatively tells us what the dynamics are between resistant and sensitive bacteria within this population. Right, the model also makes other uh, experimentally testable predictions that we confirmed, such as this idea that you can add an inhibitor of this enzyme that confers resistance. Right, so this is something that is often used clinically together with antibiotics, and it prevents uh, the enzyme from, from working properly. And what we found is that if you add this inhibitor, it actually favors the resistant population. So even though the inhibitor is specifically targeting the resistant cells, making them less resistant, that leads to an increase in the resistant fraction at equilibrium. And that's just because you, if the resistant cells are not as resistant, that means that you kind of, at equilibrium, you somehow need more of them in order to break down the antibiotic in a fixed amount of time. And that's somehow this, this basic notion of what sets the equilibrium condition. And so just coming back to this kind of basic cartoon here, what I showed you is that, well, we have a situation where uh, resistant bacteria to ampicillin breaks down this uh, antibiotic and that protects sensitive cells. Of course, this is the basic framework that might be necessary to form what you might think of as a mutualism. And indeed, what we've been able to demonstrate in, uh, in recent experiments is that if we have here, this is bacteria resistant to a different antibiotic, in this case, chloramphenicol, all right, well, if this strain now breaks down this antibiotic, then you can form a mutualism where the two strains together are able to survive in the presence of both drugs. It's worth noting here that there's, uh, although we often think that in order for something to be cooperative, some enzyme or something has to be secreted, that's uh, emphatically not the case. And in particular, uh, this strain of bacteria, uh, it's breaking down the chloramphenicol inside the cell, right? And now, that, of course, that makes it somehow less cooperative, but it doesn't completely remove the cooperative aspects because eventually this strain w does reduce the global concentration of that antibiotic, and that's what allows this strain here to grow. Right. And in this case of the mutualism, we've been uh, really excited about the dynamics of it because what we, what we see are oscillations between uh, these two subpopulations. But I uh, deleted that data just because I didn't uh, in the interest of time. Okay. Now, I, uh, a year and a half ago, I did tell you uh, about another, an, a very different situation in which we also got coexistence between cooperation and cheating. And I just want to, I just want to mention it because it's, it's uh, on the, uh, in some ways rather different, but in other ways rather similar. Right. What we found is that in yeast, Growing on the sugar sucrose, we got coexistence between the yeast that broke down that sugar and a yeast strain that doesn't contribute to that public good. All right, so instead of uh, breaking down a public bad or removing a public bad, which is the case of the antibiotics, here this is uh, the creation of a public good. But again, we see very similar things in terms of coexistence between the, uh, the cells that contribute and the cells that don't. And in many of the experiments that we've been doing over the last couple of years, we're really interested in trying to understand uh, kind of ecological factors that may influence the dynamics uh, of cooperation and cheating within a species. So for example, in this system, we've been able to demonstrate that if you add a bacterial competitor, that uh, somehow drives cooperation within the yeast population. So this is somehow a sense in which uh, you can have competition between species that favors cooperation within a species. Okay. And, and finally, uh, using this system, even in the absence of the cheaters, this is a powerful model system just to study the dynamics of cooperatively growing populations in general. In particular, such populations uh, are subject to um, sudden transitions, in particular tipping points leading to population collapse. And uh, there's been a major focus of effort in my group over the last few years trying to understand kind of universal behavior of populations and other complex systems near one of these tipping points leading to a sudden transition. And if any of you are curious about these sorts of ideas, please come and find me over, over the next day or two. But um, in, the, in this last bit that I have, I want to tell you, I want to switch gears a little bit and, and, and tell you about a different way in which we can get coexistence between different phenotypes. Right, now, in, in both the yeast system and in the bacterial system, we had negative frequency dependent interactions that stabilized phenotypic diversity uh, via uh, genetic diversity. Right, so 
these strains uh, really do have different genes, and, and so the phenotypic diversity and genetic diversity are kind of coupled. However, it's reasonable to ask whether it might be possible for one genotype to implement those different phenotypes. Right? So might it be the case that you can have phenotypic diversity without the genotypic diversity? Right? And, uh, and the basic, the simplest situation you can imagine that this might happen is, uh, is kind of some sort of uh, resource uh, mo model in the context of when there are multiple, uh, mul multiple food sources. All right? So we can imagine just we have animals here that where there's food source A and B, all right? blueberries and orange berries maybe. Now you can imagine that if all the rest of the population goes and goes to this blueberry bush, then the lone individual that goes to the orange bush is going to get more food and will therefore be more fit. Okay? However, if everyone else goes and goes to this orange bush, then, you know, then the lone individual that goes to the blue bush will actually be more fit. Right? So this is precisely the kind of situation where you might expect to get this negative uh, frequency dependence, where rare strategies do better than common strategies. And indeed, there's going to be some uh, distribution of the population, doesn't have to be 50-50, in which the fitness of these two phenotypes or genotypes would be the same. Right? Now, uh, what uh, we've been doing in experiments with the Gale Network is arguing that this is one way to think about the dynamics of yeast when they're put in mixed sugar environments. So as you heard from Hannah, uh, the, that yeast, when placed in environments with low glucose and low galactose, have this behavior where uh, there's a distribution that some fraction of the cells turn on the galactose machinery and some don't. Okay? Now, what we wanted to ask is, in this mixed sugar environment, is there a negative frequency dependent selection? Is it the case that rare strategies do better than common strategies? Now, to get at that, what we did is we, uh, we just made genetic mutants using uh, this well-characterized network where we have now one strain that is a gal on strain. So we put it in this mixed sugar environment and all the cells turn on. A different strain in the same environment, they all turn off. Okay. Now what we wanted to ask is, is there any sort of game being played between those on and off uh, kind of strains? All right. Is there frequency dependence between those strains? So what we did is we just mixed them at a variety of different fractions and then just looked to see what is the fitness of the two strains as a function of the starting fraction. So what we found is that there are very clear signatures of negative frequency dependence. Right. This is the frequency of the gal on strain as a function of, of time. So this is basically we, we start. Uh, at time zero, let them grow for 20 hours in the mixed sugar environment. What you see is that if we start with a lot of gal-on cells, then the gal-on fraction decreases. If we start with a small fraction of gal-on, then that fraction then increases. Right, so th once again, this is a situation where you cannot define fitness in the absence of the competitors. Right, so it's not the case that one strain or the other strain is more fit, but instead, which strain is more fit depends on the initial frequency. Right, so in all these situations, it's very, very common to just do something where you mix strains 50-50 and you just measure the relative fitness. And in cases where you have interactions like this, you can't do that. You have to measure it over different starting fractions. We can then plot, for example, the number of doublings over the course of this 20 hours as a function of the initial gal on fraction. And what you see is, again, I think very nice uh, data illustrating this negative frequency dependence. That the more gal on there are, the less, or the fewer doublings those gal on types are able to do and vice versa. And indeed, where those, two, where those two curves cross is telling us about the equilibrium condition. Right? That's when those two strains with different strategies have the same fitness. Okay? So you can see that there's some equilibrium here. In this case, it does happen to be around 50-50 or 45%. Right? It's important to note that just because evolution will go towards this particular point does not mean that's what maximizes fitness. Once again, when you have interactions, you don't necessarily evolve to higher fitness. And in particular, the larger gal on fraction actually saturates first, and then uh, the saturation moves off to the left. Okay? So just because something is an equilibrium in an evolutionary sense does not mean that it maximizes fitness. All right, I'm, uh, I'm maybe going to just skip the data here, but I will just say that we can, of course, change the concentration of glucose and galactose, and what we see is that the equilibrium fraction shifts as you might expect. Okay? And that's true for both the competition between the on and off mutants, and it's also, oh, all oh, right, I, uh, and it's also true for the, for the wild type, um, as Hannah said, that you can change the concentration of glucose and galactose, and that, uh, that equilibrium between the strategies will shift. I do want to stress, though, this is a case where we, uh, we started with various fractions of this on-off mutant, and then we looked to see what the dynamics are at the end of the day. But another way to do this is to just start with a pure population and then just let the system evolve. Okay? So what we did in this data here is we started with the gal-off mutant. All right, so everybody is gal off, and then we just watch after 250 generations, where just each day we dilute into a mixed sugar environment to see what happens. 
And, and as you might expect, if we're in pure glucose, then no evolution occurs in the sense that the gal, uh, the gal off stay off. If we go to pure galactose, then the gal off all turn on, as you might expect. But in the mixed sugar environment, what we see is a very nice equilibrium between off and on. Again, this is because of the negative frequency dependent interactions. Okay. And uh, I will maybe go ahead and quit because I think it's the Q&A. Uh, as you might imagine, things are always more complicated in that you cannot prove why something evolved, but I think that you can at least uh, go and make measurements to um, either support or refute different hypotheses. Okay. Right, so I'm just, I'll just summarize in 30 seconds. Uh, what we find is that often cheater strategies invade but that we get coexistence between cooperation and cheating. We've seen this in many different situations. I think it's, uh, it's a very common theme uh, in many of these cooperative situations. We also are arguing that uh, the phenotypic heterogeneity that, uh, that we observe in clonal populations, uh, it could have a variety of different evolutionary drivers if there is an evolutionary explanation at all. But one of them is that it may be the implementation of a, a mixed strategy. And more generally, uh, we're really excited about this idea that uh, using experimentally trackable uh, microcosms in the lab, we can uh, explore some of these uh, kind of classic ideas in evolutionary dynamics and theoretical ecology. And with that, I will uh, thank the group for the ones that have been doing the work, as well as uh, the Allen uh, Foundation. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Maybe right next to you there, then we'll... Just a, a, a clarification question. You mentioned that um, fitness, you know, you're looking at fitness independence of other individuals. I mean, is fitness ever not relative? My understanding is that, you know, absolute fitness doesn't exist in nature. It's always well, dependent on... Yeah, I, I guess the, the question is... Uh, how, whether you have to worry about it or not. I mean, it, in, in most of these evolution experiments, people talk about, you know, in a simple environment, people say, oh, there's a 2% fitness advantage. And, and what they mean by that is that uh, it doesn't matter whether you, you're looking at 1% or 50% or 99%, that the relative fitness is still kind of 2%, so it just kind of spreads throughout at all fractions. Hi, you showed uh, very interesting dynamics. Um, but I'm wondering if it depends on a, a variable that you didn't directly measure, and uh, which I think is important to your talk and to the previous talk, which is the, the mean distance between individual um, individuals, because that seems to be the, the critical uh, determinant as to you know, how much one individual is going to affect another one. It, you looked a lot at fractions, but the fractions could be, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of dynamics because initially they're very far apart, but once they get close together, there's going to be very different interactions. So I guess the question is, um, if you keep the distance to, uh, between individual population, individuals in a population uh, constant, um, do you still see all of this, you know, dynamics? Okay. Yeah, no, I think that there, there are multiple ways to answer. I mean, first of all, it's important to say, okay, all, all the experiments that I showed you today were all done in well-mixed liquid culture, right? So there, there, it's not that there's a fixed distance, but of course the density of bacteria or yeast or whatnot are changing. Uh, in many of these experiments, we've also done things in continuous culture in which uh, density can be fixed and, then, and you see the same dynamics. Of course, not for each one, not for every one of those measurements, but I don't think that this is, I mean, there, there are many subtleties in all this. I, I just don't know if I would say that this is, yeah, I, I know. We, we, I think we'd have to talk about it in more, in more depth in order to say, yeah. But maybe here. So I'm probably, with my questions through this day, I'll be known as the guy who keeps bringing structure up. But just for the case of yeast, if you grow them under what are more normal conditions, they form yeah. very interesting pads with diversity. But I'll shift to bacteria. So there's a very spectacular, at least from my thinking, paper that came out just this last year, December, showing that something that had been argued about for a while, that is bacterial nanowires. Yep. You've seen these things. Talk about the pili that conduct electricity. The pili that yep. conduct electricity. So uh, this, this is with uh, uh, mainly Geobacter. Uh, yeah, th sulfur this is the UMass Amherst group, is it? Yeah, but okay. it started about 10 years ago at uh, PNN, at the North Pacific Northwest Labs where they were looking for things that would pick up uranium and okay. somebody uh, made the observation. But the point is that 
bacteria of many types, these are the ones where at least they've determined how the electricity moves, which was very surprising, uh, tend to tie up in mats. And one group at one end, yep. okay, can support those that are far from the source. Seems like that might be another very interesting yeah. system to look at. Certainly, some yeah, of the and I, I, I'm, those are those are striking uh, papers. I I guess what I would say is that of course spatial structure is important, uh, but I uh, my feeling on this is that uh, often people start their measurements on exceedingly complex systems that they can't understand, and uh, my goal in general is to start with the simplest situation that we can, so we can understand something about the simplest situation, and then we can ask. What is the effect of spatial structure? And a very concrete example of this is uh, the coexistence between cooperation and cheating. Now, spatial structure could lead to coexistence of cooperation and cheating, but the point of these measurements is that even in a well-mixed environment, you can get coexistence, right? So I think often what happens is that people make measurements in a spatially structured environment. They see coexistence, they say, oh, well, we're getting this because of the spatial structure, but unless you do measurements in a well-mixed environment, then you cannot make that statement, right? So I guess I, I think that it's good to start with a simple thing and then add complexity one at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the, the spatial structure, of course, could be relevant, but it's just that you have to make a comparison if you want to make the statement. I think we have, I think we have time for one more question. All right, maybe in the back. Uh, infections, you get a more resistant clone growing out if the, the treatment fails, not a sensitive clone. I mean, if you stop treatment, you'll see a more resistant thing. So I'm just wondering, do you ever see this clinically? Secondly, have you actually uh, sub-cloned the, uh, the populations that remain after this experiment to, to show that the so-called sensitive population is still uh, sensitive and doesn't have the beta-lactamase uh, beta uh, enzyme? Yeah, so there are multiple questions there. So the answer is yes, the sensitive bacteria is still sensitive. Uh, second, I'd say the answer is yes, that this has been observed in at least animal models that uh, sensitive bacteria can be protected by resistant bacteria. We've also demonstrated it's the case in the context of uh, gut bacteria inside the worm that the resistant bacteria can protect the sensitive bacteria. Um, of course, this doesn't explain everything. I mean, I, you know, so it's, I, 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 I don't know if I would say, I'm not going to go and start prescribing different drugs as a result of what we're doing well, here. Well, but does but it relate to a clinical experience with antibiotic treatment? In other words, is it possible for a sensitive population to survive in the presence of a resistant population? And I just personally, and you know, after 45 years of experience treating patients, have never seen that happen. Right. Well, I guess the question is, do you, I mean, how often do people actually go and assay what fraction of their population is sensitive? I guess what I would say is that We've measured it in the context of worm infections, and others have measured it in the context of animals. Uh, but you know, that, doesn't mean, I, that doesn't mean that in every inf infection out there that this is going to be a big problem. But I think it, it definitely can happen uh, because we've measured it. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah.